decided to go low tech today, so no slides. Thank you to Meredith, Kate, and the organizers for inviting me and all of us to this incredible convening. What's at stake from my perspective over the next five to 10 years is the impact of AI and technology on racial inequality, economic inequality, and democracy itself. My reading of the evidence and conflicting viewpoints among scholars and thought leaders around the impact of AI in the labor market is that there will, no doubt, be disruption and change. While I'm not sure if we'll create new jobs to displace the old, I am convinced that the process will be painful because it always is. It took fears of social revolution and massive worker disruption to enact the 20th century New Deal. That New Deal was in response to the painful transition from agriculture to a civilized industrial economy. One of Dr. King's lieutenants, Bayard Rustin, organized the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And he wrote a reflective essay a few months later obsessing about this thing called automation. He wrote, the civil rights movement alone cannot provide jobs for all. It cannot solve the problems raised by automation, and automation deprives Negroes of jobs more than any other single factor, including prejudice. Under automation, we are faced with a new civil war situation all over again. Talk about hyperbole. Once again, the union cannot endure only half free. It cannot survive if it is divided into those who receive high incomes and those who are unemployed and subsist on the dole. Now here, Rustin is raising concerns about automation, racial inequality, and the future of American democracy. Automation did come, but the labor market institution of mass incarceration ended up having a much larger effect. The big question for me then is, who wins and who loses in this period of disruptive change? We know already, those who own capital and those who own technology will win. Workers will lose, at least in the short run, and especially workers already racially marginalized and excluded from our current labor market. Now, this goes beyond whether robots will be black or white, and I think from Eric's slide I saw Baxter is blue, so we're making some progress. <laughs> Since the 1960s, black unemployment has always been double white unemployment. The lowest black unemployment rate today, 6.7% in the state of Virginia, is the highest white unemployment rate, which is the same in West Virginia. In several cities, black unemployment is still at recession and depression era levels. Think 10, 20, or even 30% in some places. So the issue that deserves our collective attention right now is the potential social unrest and revolt by the losers of AI and those excluded from the benefits. Social unrest, in my view, is probably inevitable, from low-level robot and machine vandalism to possibly more disruptive revolts, especially from those who used to be middle class. After all, it's highly educated yet downwardly mobile middle class workers, those who see no economic future, who tend to become the most radicalized. While there might be a race against the machines, there is also race and the machines, as in the interaction of racial inequality and disruptive technological change. Many of you in New York know the name Eric Garner. As of Tuesday, we're learning the name Alton Sterling and unfortunately another last night. Both Garner and Sterling were excluded from the formal economy and were participating in the informal economy, in Garner's case, selling loose cigarettes, in Sterling's case, selling CDs. In both cases, the result was death, and death from state violence. Predictive policing could prevent this in the future, but as we just heard from Julia, it will also probably exacerbate existing racial inequalities in terms of our system of policing. In that sense, technology isn't the magic bullet to solve deeply entrenched social systems of racism or marginalization or segregation. And our 18th, 19th, and 20th century political institutions probably won't keep up with the pace of change and the painful consequences from it. So I don't see any scenario where that will change with our current politics and institutions, which raises a final point. Will democracy survive? And in this case, American democracy. Oligarchy, or rule by the rich few, is already here wherever you look. We have the data to prove it. And thus, the pain from economic dislocations Americans are already feeling right now, we're seeing manifested politically in this election cycle. So if you think this is bad, just wait. The peasants with their pitchforks are coming, and everyone in this room has a choice. We can build fortresses, or we can build democracy and social protection. We do still have human agency to imagine and enact a new New Deal for the 21st century. 
And the question before us is how can we enlist the various social movements afoot, whether what used to be called Occupy Wall Street or the immigrant rights movement or the movement for black lives, how can we enlist that energy in a project of such a new, new deal and the enhancement of American democracy and well-being? Thank you. Thank you, Dorian.